Hey, beautiful friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Robin Graham show. You guys have heard me say it. I don't even know how many times, but you don't have to be on social media to grow your business. You can build a successful, sustainable business without having to spend 24 seven checking Instagram, watching your follower account, looking at your likes and trying to engage with stuff that you really don't even align with. Well, today I am bringing in a very special guest to lend to my credibility. And I <laughs> want to showcase her and her work because she wrote the book, Social Slowdown, Market Your Business Without Sacrificing Your Mental Health. So two subjects that are very near and dear to my health, my heart, right? Mental health and growing your business without social media. So we're going to hit the nail on the head today and knock it out of the ballpark. I just used analogies that probably don't make any sense and two back to back. We're just throwing really hammers. Together. We're but throwing hammers into the outfield is what that's we're doing. What we're doing. <laughs> that is what we're doing, Meg. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Meg Casebolt onto the Robin Graham show. I am so excited to be here with you, Robin. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, Meg, it's going to be a great conversation. You guys, we were giggling like schoolgirls, <laughs> for lack of a better term, behind the scenes in the green room, air quotes, uh, <laughs> before we started recording because we have so much in common and it's so exciting. And I think the one thing I want to emphasize is that whether you love social media or you hate social media, there are always opportunities to collaborate with other people. I mean, Meg and I basically have the same philosophies. We do very similar things, but here we are collaborating to share information that is so valuable to help you make decisions that can ultimately change your business and change your life. So we're going to dive into this topic of social slowdown and how you can start marketing your business without having this negative monstrous effect on your mental health and your and your overall well-being so you can show up and serve at the level and the energy with the energy level that you want to show up and serve so meg that was like a long introduction but i'm <laughs> dying for you to tell the listeners just a little bit about you and your journey to get to where you are today and why you wrote the book Sure. Um, hi. So hi, everyone. My name is Meg Casebolt. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and I originally, before writing this book, before exploring this topic of social media, um, I started a freelance business as a web designer, and then that converted into an SEO agency. So helping my clients to get their websites to show up on uh, Google search, basically, uh, any search engine, but Google's the, the big guy that we talk about a lot in SEO, as you know. Um, and in order to be able to teach people the basics of search engine optimization, I took the approach that was common at the time. So this was five, six years ago, the late teens, where everybody had a Facebook group and you would invite your audience into your Facebook group. And then, you know, I had a couple hundred people in my Facebook group learning SEO with me and showing up to my live trainings and I would live stream in there. And I, I use that as my hub, as my home base. Um, and it worked really well for a fair amount of time. And, you know, I was able to encourage people to join my paid programs, to book consulting calls with me by teaching them within that, that container, within that Facebook group. And then over time, I started to invest more of my time, more of my resources into the Facebook group. I hired a social media manager. She was in there every day asking, you know, asking those sort of prompt questions of like, what you, it's, you know, wacky Wednesday, what socks are you wearing? That had absolutely nothing to do with what it was that I was trying to teach, but we had to play the algorithm. Um, I was live streaming regularly and people were getting their questions answered, but they were getting their questions answered well enough that they weren't buying my programs. Over time, people stopped showing up. The algorithm stopped working for me. I would have had to pay for ads to get people in. There were more bots than there were humans. Things just really shifted in that space. And it got to a point where I sat down and looked at the metrics of the group and went, oh, I'm losing a lot of money by spending my time in here. I'm investing a lot of my time, even though I have a dedicated team member who is creating content for this. It's still her coming to me and saying, well, how do we want to respond to this person, right? So even though it was sort of her group that she was supposed to be running, I was still the subject matter expert. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then we said, oh, well, let's expand our reach. Let's go and we'll, we'll, we'll start to create more for LinkedIn and for Instagram. And I, thankfully I never got into Twitter, but you know, <laughs> I did. I read romance novels and like memes on Twitter, but, <laughs> but not for my business, right? Um, romance Landia is very popular on Twitter or it used to be when it was Twitter. Now it's X anyway. Um, so then I, I doubled down on social media and we kept looking at the numbers and we kept realizing that I was spending a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of someone else's time to build an audience that was not necessarily buying from me. So my follower count was going up. My metrics that don't mean any, well, not don't mean anything. My engagement metrics, my interactions, my reach, those were all going up. Everything looked good, but I was hemorrhaging money on social media. And then when I looked at where people were actually buying from, it was my email list. And I was neglecting my email list. And I was neglecting my relationships, my referral relationships, the people who were sending me leads. I wasn't spending time cultivating those relationships because I was so busy creating for social. And so after we looked at that information, after I looked at my expense reports and my time management. And, you know, I, I log my time to figure out what I'm doing. I was like, I gotta, I gotta stop. And I felt terrible about it because I had this sunk cost. I had hundreds of people who were accustomed to hearing from me in this way. And I had to go through almost like a grieving process of saying, I'm going to shut this down come get on my email list. I'm going to let this team member go because I didn't have need for her services anymore. She was great at what she did. My metrics were great. I wasn't making any money from it and I couldn't justify the cost. And it was really hard to make that choice. And so... I made that decision in May of 2021 um, and let her go and, you know, sent her to somebody else. I wasn't just like, oh, you know, you're on your own. Um, I had another friend who needed a really great social media manager. And so they got Sarah, right? <laughs> she, she wasn't out on the streets or anything. Um, it all works. It all comes. It all works. Circle. It all plays into it. And without Sarah there to say to me, okay, can you approve these posts? What should we do this day? I forgot to keep posting on social media. You know, we shut down the Facebook group. I still had Instagram. I still had LinkedIn. I just plain old walked away, which is not a good marketing strategy, Robin. Mm. (laughs) Would not recommend, but my head felt so much clearer. And as an SEO person throughout this entire process, I was making videos for YouTube. I was still blogging. I was, I started doubling down on emailing my list instead of spending that time to post on social. And even though I forgot to post on social media, my income did not change. My lead generation, I was still getting the same number of people finding me. They were just coming from referrals because I was spending my time engaging with people who already knew me instead of trying to create for some algorithm that may or may not show my content to people, you know? And once I hit about a month and a half and then looked at my, you know, opened up Instagram on my phone and went, oh my gosh, I have a lot of DMs that I've completely ignored. Um, I kind of thought to myself, like, how long can I go? What would happen if, this is an experiment, right? Everything in your marketing is an experiment. What would happen if I didn't post? So I went a full 100 days. I looked at the calendar and I went, when am I going to post again to be able to say that I did it, right? Like sometimes you just try things. Yeah. (laughs) And you and I met through Michelle Mazur and she's a big fan of like, what's the experiment? What's the hypothesis? What are the outcomes that we're driving towards, right? Like kind of just what would happen if. Yeah. And then I started emailing and posting about the experience of going 100 days without social media. And everyone was like, wait, did you, how, but how how did you market then if you weren't on social? And I realized that there's this, this connection in people's brains of they hear marketing, but they think social media and there's so much more. Mm -hmm. And I want to stop you right there for a second, because you have said so many things. So much. So much. You asked for the story, but I know that we could have talked about every piece (laughs) of that story individually. (laughs) We absolutely could have. And I want to emphasize a few things, but um, now I have to remember all of those things. There's the problem. One is, yeah, one is that um, digital marketing does not equate to Instagram and Facebook. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There are so many other things that are available digitally 
And, you know, we live in such an online space, whether you have a brick and mortar business or an agency that has walls around it, or you're working from home on a laptop or working at Whole Foods from a la on a laptop, it doesn't matter. There are other digital ways to market your business. And I want to like squash that myth because I think we're so inundated with how can you go off of social media? People think mm -hmm. I'm crazy when I say I'm really not on social media. Like I go on periodically just to check to see if there's messages or whatever. But I love how you said you went off, you forgot about it. And today was the first day I've been on social media. And the only reason I went on social media this week that was because somebody sent me a message and I got the ping because for some reason I still get Facebook notification. I don't know. Anyway, whatever. You know how <laughs> it's so complicated to find <laughs> where you turn things on and off. Anyway, I just kind of let it sit there. But I think something that you said was that don't do that. Don't just step away and forget about it. I think we do need to say, if we're going to step away from it, like, let your followers know, mm -hmm. okay, I'm stepping away, but follow me on my email list because I'll Here's how to getting... keep in touch with me instead. Here's yes. the way to communicate with me. Yeah. Yes. Well, before, well, before I stepped away, I set up an autoresponder. They don't let you do this anymore, but I set up an autoresponder in my business page, my business Facebook page autoresponder where people DM'd us for the business. It would just autoresponder and be like, we don't check this. Here's our email address. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I cannot be like, even I have a team, I still cannot be everywhere, nor do I want to feel the responsibility to have conversations in six different places where I don't have systems set up in six different places to be in five different social media contexts and, you know, the different groups that I'm in that have DMs available. No, I, I have a system in my inbox where my team and I are able to assign things to each other to make sure nothing gets lost. And that's how we want to be communicated with. And if the only way that you can communicate with your potential service providers and vendors and contractors is through Instagram DMs, then I am not the right person for you. We are not the agency for you. Find, find somebody else who wants to communicate that way. Fantastic. But I had to figure out what our boundaries were and how we wanted to engage and when we wanted to engage and how we can articulate that to our clients, to our potential clients, to our audience and have something there in our, in our email signature that says like, and also we don't work on weekends. We don't work at night mm -hmm. because we don't yeah. want to, and we shouldn't right. have to, yeah. <laughs> right? And I just because you can, just because you can contact me at that time does not mean that I have to reply back to you within yeah. I don't know, 72 hours. Who says? Who says? Who says I have says? to be on all the time? And and I love that. You have a whole chapter in the book about boundaries and how you can establish those boundaries around social media. So say you still want to be on it because you want to connect with nieces, nephews, yeah. family, whatever. That's fine. But you don't have to designate that space for your business. And you can set boundaries around, okay, I'm going to go on and just check and see, and then just follow those accounts that are safe from a mental health perspective, mm -hmm. from a political perspective, <laughs> all of that stuff. Because I know you mentioned this in the book too. And that's one of the reasons I went off because of all of the animosity that I felt every time I was on there, just people slamming each other and attacking each other. But not only that, it's this, and Michelle Mazur is the one that, that I think really influenced me to think this way too, is that this bro marketing concept. Mm. Listen, not every single human is meant to make 60K a month or a million dollars in a quarter. And so when you're on these platforms and you're inundated with all of this, it can do so many things to your mental health. One, it mm -hmm. makes you feel inferior and unworthy. It causes you to go down that path of comparison, imposter syndrome, doubt, fear, all those things that if you're in that mindset, you're not going to be able to grow your business, whether you're on social media or not. And totally. so you have to set those boundaries to say, okay, I'm going to allow myself this time on this day or this time every day, whatever it is you want to do and do X, Y, Z on the platform, but you don't have to be on there and you don't have to respond that mm -hmm. fast because let's face it before social media, were people responding in five minutes? No, that's not a realistic expectation to put on yourself. And if, if people who are just members of your free audience, not necessarily your paying customers, are getting that sort of response time, then when they do give you money, 
they're going to expect an even higher level of service that is going to potentially impact the, your capacity, your your ability to take care of yourself, um, especially those of us who were, you know, socialized and raised as women, we were told that we come second, that, that you know, not just the customer is always right, but that our needs don't matter. And then we put ourselves into an environment where we suddenly have the goal, whether or not it's a good goal, we have the goal of a million followers, which means up to a million people demanding our attention all the time and expecting us to respond quickly. And even, you know, even if you're just there during business hours, it's still a distraction. It's mm-hmm. still something that's going to pull you away from the thing that is the reason that you started your business. Most of us did not go into business to become social media influencers. Right. And nor do like, I don't want to be fair because right? to me, it, and you talk about this in the book. And I think it's really important because we have looped in mental health a couple of times, but social media opened up this door, like a gate floodgate really for people to go on and talk about the extent of their trauma or all yeah. of this stuff. And it's like, okay, we've had so many episodes on the show about personal branding. Cause it's something I'm passionate about. But building a personal brand doesn't mean you have to get so vulnerable that you're opening yourself up to external critique, external judgment, external pressure. And not every one of us is comfortable telling all of this stuff. Yeah, there seems so, to be this idea that like, if you're authentic, you must give your like the biggest skeletons in your closet to seem real. No, you, you get to pick and choose. And this comes back to boundaries. Boundaries aren't just time. Boundaries aren't just resources. Boundaries are your stories and your experiences and what you do and don't share. A very easy example to share just because it's, it's tangible is like, people know that I have kids. I try not to share their pictures. I try not to tell their names. Sometimes I'll talk about the experience of parenting as a parent, but I don't want to tell their stories because it's their stories when they get a little older you know they're they're six and eight right now but when they get a little older we'll have to have conversations about what you do and don't share and that way I can say I haven't shared on your behalf right so figuring out but other people their brand is I'm a parent these are my kids look at their faces here's what they said isn't that funny like that's part of their brand so as part of yours, just because you see other people sharing pictures of their kids doesn't mean that you have to. Just because you want to doesn't mean that you shouldn't, right? But making some intentional choices about what you do and don't make publicly available to the internet at large. Yeah, it's discernment. Don't just right? go to the default. Yeah, it's discernment. Yeah, it's absolutely it's discernment, discernment of yeah. what is right for you, what aligns with your values, and stepping mm-hmm. away with what doesn't align with your values. And mm-hmm. I think just because it's a platform and just because it feels good because you're getting a dopamine hit every time you want and see a like or see a share or whatever, that doesn't mean it's a good place to just let yourself go and not stay aligned with your values. Mm -hmm. So, okay. We've kind of like beat around this, the topic of mental health and boundaries and all of these things, which there's so much we could talk about. So much. So I could have written a whole nother, like this could have been the whole book. This was only a third of the book, but I could have easily written another 100 pages. And like the other thing I could, I could write a hundred pages and the research is not being done. This is not something, this is not something that universities are spending money on. Universities are maybe spending money on what is happening with social media in the university space and in the adolescent space, but not necessarily in adults and especially adults who are relying on the internet for our livelihoods. Mm-hmm. There's a lot and of it, pressure there that people are not documenting. Mm-hmm. And when we look at just it, since 2020, I mean, obviously we had COVID in there. And where Mm -hmm. did everybody flock to during COVID with social social media media because it gave them some sense of exposure and, you know, engagement with other people, community. And that was a good thing, right? Like we all got online and we felt like we were in solidarity with each other and we connected with each other and we didn't feel as isolated. Like there are absolutely benefits of social media not just drawbacks, but there are plenty of drawbacks too. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think we also saw the rise of anxiety over Mm -hmm. 25%, the prevalence increased. So with that being said, obviously COVID did a number on everyone and the anxiety and the fear and all of that stuff. 
But all of that additional time spent on social media has to have played an impact on that, the prevalence overall. And I think it's something that scientists, researchers, people in the mental health industry really do need to start looking at because as women, especially as mothers, we need to be healthy because about the genetics, if we're not healthy, ain't nobody going to be healthy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we really do have to, to observe that and, and make note of that. Okay. So let's, let's shift gears a little bit. Because I do want to also add really quickly, when you said as yeah. mothers, as women, I want to say anybody who is in any sort of marginalized community, not yes, just 100%, you know, not just so women. You're right. I think, yes, women feel this because of the ways that we've been socialized. But also when we think about uh, the intersectionality of that, Black yeah. women, women of color, people of color, transgendered yes. people, non-binary people, they're feeling that pressure and that anxiety to perform even more so then, you know, I'm a cisgendered white woman. <laughs> like right. I, I have things pretty good and I'm still feeling the anxiety. So how much yes. harder is it for those people who are expected to perform in a different way? So I just want to yeah. put that out there. Or like you said, the marginalized people who cannot physically enter the world that all of these other people are presenting. Right. There are a lot of people who are in in the disability community who maybe have some physical limitations and cannot be a part of a community out in physical spaces. So they have found their communities online and they have gone online and they have found a really good sense of connection and support in that space. But it can also have some sort of drawbacks. Same with people who are neurodivergent. You know, often they are finding themselves online because it can be a more comfortable space. But there are things that are difficult about reading social cues or the amount of stimulation coming into our brains. You know, if you're a highly sensitive person and you are just scrolling through your social media, and then you're just bing, 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 bing. There's so many lights and sounds and the auto plays. It, it can be very, very like overstimulating to our nervous system. Overstimulating systems. for sure. Mm-hmm. And especially, you know, neuro, neurodivergent, like we talk about ADHD, sensory integration disorders, like all mm-hmm. of these things can really put someone into a tailspin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So very, very important facts. Love it all. So let's talk about marketing in general. So if we're not going to market our businesses on social media, there are so many other, a plethora of other ways to market your business, right? And you touched on all of them in the book and listeners- Not all of them. I think I made seven, I think I listed 17 options. Which is pretty good. Pretty good. I I I never want to, like, I feel like there's so much like doom and gloom, chicken little, the sky is falling marketing stuff happening right now where it's like AI is breaking the internet and blogging is dead and email marketing is dead. But like, what are we going to do instead? Yeah, exactly. And I don't believe any of that is dead. Me neither. I mean, I, (laughs) I think we're on the same page there, but we t- you talk about it and listeners, I have a blog post. I also have a free ebook and I will put all of that in the show notes, the links so that you have access to those easily, readily, just go to the show notes and you'll have it all. But I want to t- to focus on when we talk about marketing, there is like the, it's almost like a, a reverse funnel kind of thing where you have the a- awareness of your brand, your business, what you offer. Then you have the, the relationships, relationship building, which is referrals, collaborations, all those ways you can grow your business. And then you have conversion. So it's the ABCs and you have a chapter of this on the book as well. And I would love to talk about that because when you think of social media, I, I do believe social media is a great place to build relationships. I have friendships that I would not have if I hadn't been on Instagram. So that's pretty cool. But I, there are other ways to build those relationships. So let's just go through the ABCs. And then you have the, in the book, you sit, have the ABC G. So, and. Oh yeah, I do. <laughs> do. I'm glad you read it. Cause I forgot I wrote that, but yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so I would love to circle back about that because you're, and we've done episodes on intuition as well, but your gut instincts, your intuition is so incredibly powerful to lead you into your marketing strategy and the things that you choose to grow your business and or not grow your business. So you need mm-hmm. to follow that. But I'm going to let you have the platform for a minute and just kind of dive into those ABCs and G of marketing in general. Sure. So the way that I like to think about how do you measure whether or not your marketing is working is through these metrics that you just sort of 
you know, lined up for me to bump that spike. Um, the first is awareness. Do people know that you exist? You're not going to make a hundred sales if only 10 people know that you're running a business. You just need to get yourself out there. Some of this is what you talk about so often, Robin, around personal branding and letting people know what it is that you stand for. Um, in my world, a lot of people are coming to me because they want to be found in search engines like Google, YouTube, you know, like those sort of discovery platforms. Um, but even networking and just handing out business cards is awareness. People can't give you money. They can't hire you. They can't buy from you unless they know that you exist and that you have something that you're selling. There's awareness. Then we have the next step, the B, building relationships. I know it's a bit of a stretch, but you know, no, <laughs> do you need acronyms to work? Yeah. It's important. I think, I think social media lives here, building relationships with people you already know. Sure. You could go onto Instagram and look for a hashtag and find somebody, or you could, you know, look for trending topics on Twitter or look for a Facebook group on a topic you're looking for. Sure. You can still do that. You can still have those people discover you on social, but for the most part, Social media is a way to keep in touch with people you already know or to leverage relationships with people you already know. So if you're following my agency on Instagram, you you can go over, you know, instagram.com slash love it for search. And then you can follow what we're putting out. But still, even if you're following us, only 10% of people who follow us are actually going to see that. I could also say, hey, I was on Robin's show and I could tag you and say, you know, at Robin Graham and go check out her podcast and people could discover you that way. But even mm -hmm. still, that's them learning about you, discovering you through a relationship. Mm -hmm. So social media lives in this building relationships level. It's not necessarily the place where people are being discovered and it's not necessarily a place where people are buying. Mm -hmm. Some industries, yes. Instagram has become much more of a shopping network. I know. Um, oh my gosh. I'm telling you what, like I have to stay off of it just for that. Every day. I'm so I, Every time I go on there. Anthropology. Something, something Sephora, I want. Whatever. And, it, and it's so funny because I could have had a conversation with someone. And the next thing, time I go on Instagram, there's an ad for that thing. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I don't oh, like they're this. They're listening. They're <laughs> listening. Okay. So other building relationship opportunities, <laughs> collaborations like this, where we're sharing each other's platform. Maybe this isn't even a collaboration. This is like a platform sharing mechanism. Um, referral partnerships, referring other people to say, oh, I know, I know who you should talk to. Right. Or um, affiliate relationships are often building relationships or um, repeat customers, reaching out to people that you've already worked with. We forget that sometimes because we're so excited about like, who's the next person that I can sign versus, hey, who might still need what I offer? Who might be able to do a subscription instead of a one time, right? That sort of retention is building relationships. And then our ABCs, awareness, building relationships, conversions, which is turning people from leads into customers, encouraging them to give you money in some way, right? Like none of us are running our businesses as a public service. Even those of us who are running not-for-profit organizations still need to get donations. So what is it that we can do to have some sort of value transaction with our customers, whether the conversion is come join my email list, subscribe to my podcast, or hey, please come give me money, right? <laughs> it's not a bad thing to ask for money. That's something else that those of us socialized as women have been told like, oh, give it all away for free. No, you are an expert and you deserve to be paid like one. Okay. That's a totally different soapbox. Totally different, totally different subject. However, you said you're an expert in this. How many years did you study, read, take courses? How much money did you invest in all of mm -hmm. that in addition to the time to become the expert? So, and then people just want to DM me to get free advice because they think yeah. that I can Google it, right? Like, yeah. if yeah. you want that information, go Google it yourself and figure it out. I'm not, yeah. he, you can't get access to my brain for free anymore. That was the big takeaway that I had from shutting down that Facebook group. No access to my time and my brain one-on-one -on -one for free anymore. Yeah. You, you want to learn from me? Here's my YouTube channel. <laughs> Right. Like here's my podcast. Here's a way that I can produce something that can continue to be an asset in my business after the moment that I create it. Mm -hmm. Final ABC awareness, building relationships, conversions, 
and then your gut, right? You might have a business coach or a marketing mentor who says, I know exactly what you need. This is the framework that worked for me and it will work for you too. And it might make your gut churn because you don't want to run your business that way. That's not in alignment with your values. It's totally fine for that business person if that's what works for them. But if it doesn't feel good to you, if somebody says, well, this is the framework, you have to follow it. And then you go, oh, you don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. You have autonomy. You have your own life, your family, your values, your brain, your time, your resources, your expertise. Those are all completely different, uh, almost maybe diametrically opposite to a lot of the people who are showing you Facebook ads that tell you that they did it a certain way and you can follow their same framework and you don't have to think about it. There's something really desirable about someone else giving us a plan and all we have to do is execute it. But there's some critical thinking that can happen here too and some intuitive recognition of, yeah, that does look like a good system, but I hate it. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. is a, a data point that you can use to make decisions about your strategic plans. Yeah, it, it's so funny that you say that because the last couple of coaches I've had have been all high ticket, high ticket, high ticket, high ticket does not feel good to me. It mm -hmm. doesn't feel good to me in my gut because I'm a server, I'm a helper. And I also realize that there is a subset of the population that doesn't have that to invest because mm -hmm. of their family situation or whatever. So that was one thing that didn't feel good to me. And I had to, I had to go through a couple of different things in order to discover that. But my gut was saying it to me all the time, the whole entire mm -hmm. time. But because I was in this container, I felt like I had to do what I was being told I had to do. And that discernment, again, here comes that word discernment is so important to know what is right for you and your values versus what somebody else is telling you, you have to do. And totally. I think this stigma of you have to be on social media to build a business has been thrown at us for so many years now that we've just come to accept it. But if it doesn't feel good, we don't have to sit in that place. And that's the same thing. When I did my last launch, it was like, my coach was telling me, well, even if you're not if you aren't using it, you should still put, put all this on social media because you'll get more clients. If you put it on social media, who says, who says, who says? because my people were not buying from me from social media ever, yeah. ever. So now I'm just creating things that just going to throw into the void. I'm going to hire somebody else to put it up. I'm going to spend my time on this. No, yeah. I could be spending that time. Even if it's 20 minutes a week, I could be spending that time on a discovery call. I could be spending that time on writing an email, right? Like what is the opportunity cost that I'm missing out on by spending it on that instead? Um, to give a, a different example, you know, uh, I, I for years would run live launches this isn't social media. So I wanted to give a, a different example that works for some people and didn't feel good in my gut. For years, I ran live launches where I would say, you know, we're starting this program on, I don't know, October 17th. And so bye by October 10th to get the early bird bonus. And then on, you know, the cart is closing on the 16th at midnight and you can't join after that. Um, and everyone should join right now because this is the last chance, right? Like a lot of that urgency stuff. And oh, but sign up by this date to get the fast action bonus. And uh, all of that works really well. And it worked really well for my business too. And then I had people joining my programs who weren't ready for them or who had other commitments happening in their lives and didn't have the time to be able to spend on what I was trying to teach them. And then they wouldn't get great results. Mm -hmm. And so my messaging is very lenient um, to the point that I know I lose sales for it, where I could say to people like, we start next week, time to join. You have to join now, last chance to join. No, what I say now is like, we open the doors twice a year. If this isn't the right time for you, we'll be back in February. I'm not going anywhere. Oh, you don't want to join this program? That's okay. Here's, you can book this service anytime. Here's how you can book a consulting call anytime. I'm not going anywhere. Like the, I'm not going anywhere might be one of my brand values now that I'm saying it out loud. I'm just like longevity. Mm-hmm. Why do we, yeah, yeah, you're going to get better results. If you come prepared, I'm going to feel better about you. If you are ready, 
-hmm. I'm not going to try to force you to buy something that you're not ready for. And that's not something you hear very often. It's not, it's not. And I really think that that's something that the the pendulum is shifting because of the Mm -hmm. economy. And some people are like, oh, that that's ridiculous. There's no change. There is a change. Oh yeah. The economy is impacting sales and buying decisions, period. But it's also affecting how people are smarter. They're more savvy and they're holding on to their dollars more. So, and I would say they've been burned said, a lot more by now. I think the experience is that yes. people are more hesitant because they have been, they have I don't know if been, I can square it. They've been screwed. They have been. And yeah. I really think that, I really think it's all coming to fruition now too, because these live launches and things like that are not working like they used to work. And I also, and you pointed this out in the book and we've kind of gotten off track from the ABC. <laughs> but, but I never um, do that. <laughs> No, the ADHD brain. Woo. No, I didn't pick um, my Adderall all this morning and you can feel it, can't you? <laughs> it's jumping at me through the screen. No, I'm it's kidding. right here, but it's too late in the day. You know, like I can't take my Adderall at noon. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. Um, oh gosh, now what was I going to say? Oh, you oh, mentioned gosh. this in the book. See, this is, we're not, this is hilarious. So <laughs> we, um, you mentioned in the book how, and I'm pretty sure this was in your book and not somewhere else that I read this, but I'll how, tell you and we can cut it out if it's <laughs> right. Exactly. Like the Amy Porterfields of the world, mm. when they got their start launching on social media, it was a completely different time, different opportunity. They were able to build because there was there was nothing else like it out there. Mm-hmm. But now that marketplace is so saturated and so noisy that the opportunities that existed back then when they built their empires are not in existence today. Yeah. Amy Porterfield, Marie Forleo, Pat Flynn, Chris Gillibo, Stu McLaren, like anybody who kind of came up at that time period and built a brand in that way, um, they didn't have the competition. And really, to an extent, their growth was being subsidized by the social media platforms because the social media platforms wanted to be able to hold them up as successes. And then all of them independently in their own ways and everyone else who was like named five, but you know, they all diversified too and said, I'm also going to do YouTube. I'm also going to have a podcast. I'm going to write a book. And I think everyone that I listed, except maybe Marie Forleo, now have stake in software companies that they are using. They're they're doing affiliate marketing for their software companies, right? Like they, even they, who we think of as these are the social media kings and queens, shouldn't use that gender term, monarchies, um, they are still, they're diversified. They're not getting their money from social media anymore. They might have the big brands. They might spend a lot on the ads to be able to show up in front of you so that way they can get you into their funnels. But their money's coming from email marketing, software sales, affiliate marketing, you know, sponsored deals. It's not coming from social media. Yeah. And it's such a misconception. Mm -hmm. Just because you're seeing them on those platforms does not mean that that is how they are experiencing their growth. Yeah. Yeah. And just because they did it doesn't mean you can do it now. That's right. One ha- and and you can't. It's we are in a totally different environment. It's so mm-hmm. much more saturated. It's so much noisier. And really, these platforms are all based on ads. And I've said this in episodes before, where if you're not investing money, the algorithm is not going to show you off to anybody mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. They don't care. They're it's not pay to play. there for you. No. It's pay to play. They are there to make money for their business. They're not there to support you and grow you and your business. So it's something to keep in mind, but this comes full circle now to the ABCs and the G, because if you're thinking, I, it's really important to do that gut check to say, okay, am I striving to be Marie Forleo or Amy Porterfield or Pat Flynn, or am I me? And this is where I'm at. And this is what feels good to me. And I'm going to build my business my way. And that's where I think this customized approach to building your business is so key. And in the book, you have those 17 in my blog post and in my ebook, there's, I, I list 10, but there there's like subsets under those 10. So yeah. Probably, probably 17. <laughs> I may have total. overcounted 17 if I, if I were to categorize them differently. You yeah. know? Right. I mean, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Exactly. But I think it's just the really, idea is there are, there are alternatives <laughs> and a lot of alternatives and yeah. you get to decide as the business owner, what feels good to you, where you want to spend your time, how you want to spend your time, where you want to invest your money, 
and your energy, because at the end of the day, time and energy are currency. So you have to factor that in to whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. If it's draining you, it's not worth it. If it's draining you, think about it. I don't want to say it's not worth it. If it's draining you, but it's really doing well, maybe you want to outsource it. Maybe you want to batch yeah, it. Maybe true. you want to find a different way to approach it. And that's why I call this social slowdown and not like antisocial, right? Yeah. And maybe there are ways important. you can do this more efficiently, more intentionally, more effectively. You don't have to exit. Maybe you choose one platform that works really well. You know, I, I know a lot of people who are, they left Instagram and now they're only on LinkedIn because LinkedIn has a very different algorithm than some of the more yes. social entertainment channels. Um, and that's an option too. Some people are like, I'm going to go only on Instagram for business. And then I'm not going to use my TikTok channel anymore for business. I'm just going to use that to watch videos of cats falling off of ledges and creepy dollhouses, right? Like you don't have to have your business everywhere. You don't have to post everywhere. You don't have to engage everywhere. You can still just be a user. And, you know, I, half of my Facebook now, now that I've sort of extracted my ego from it and extracted my business from it it's gone back to being hey these are humans that I actually want to talk to hey here's the update from my neighbors who have free pottery sitting outside and the PTSA that needs to tell us about the meeting this week like I'm finally getting back to using it as a consumer instead of as a creator which feels mm -hmm. very different to me as a user okay make that decision about how you want to utilize how you want to engage, how you want to feel yeah. on these platforms. And if you don't want to do it, you don't have to. And yeah. if you do set some boundaries. <laughs> yeah. But I want to close with this because you made the, you shared the quote in the book, which I've heard numerous times before how, and I can't remember the person that originally said it. It's a, a gentleman, but it, it's, if it's free, you're the product. Yeah. And, and just it was, uh, I'm going to say Richard Sellers, but that not, might not be totally correct. Um, but the idea, he he said it about television advertising, which yes. is broad, broadcast TV, pre-cable broadcast TV when he said it in like 1973 or something. Yeah, long um, time ago. Yeah, it's not Sellers. So now that I'm saying that, I'm like, oh, Peter Sellers, who wrote this book now. Yeah. Um, but if you're, if you're not paying, then you're the product, right? And he was talking about it as over the air advertising. But the truth is that if you're on a platform like Instagram, like Facebook, like Twitter, if you're not paying into advertising, then you are being advertised to, even if you are, no, let's, let's not even take that out there. You are being advertised to, you are the product that is being sold to the advertisers. Your information is being gathered and pulled from you from not just what you're doing on those platforms, but from around the internet, the cookies that you're gathering information about what you're buying, what you're talking about. Like you were saying, we were like, I had a conversation and then I got an ad for it. Um, you are being packaged up and sold as a commodity. And let's get a little bit like subversive here. You are being pushed into a specific categorization of how they expect you to behave. And then you are being given political content that is often very conservative because that is who is paying to advertise to you. So if you are not actively working to create a feed that is I don't, I don't even know what the word would be, anti-racist, <laughs> you know, like that it's anti-political. If you're not actively working on it, then you're going to be fed things that may or may not be in alignment with what it is that your values are. Yeah. On either side. Like, yeah, it goes both ways. I think if you're depending on what you like or don't like, you're going to see whatever is the opposite because that's what they're trying to promote or get you to convert to, right? It's no, like the research shows that it's almost all going to go left. Oh, really? Or it's all, almost all going to go right. It's almost all going to go more conservative. Oh, you said that in the book. You yeah. said that in the book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah there was this really fascinating study that um, a BBC reporter did where she took five different phones and created five different personas. Yes, you said had that them. in the book. Yeah, it's really cool. So where like she she made two of them liberal, two of them conservative, one of them completely apolitical, and all but one of them got more conservative feeds over time based on what it was that they liked. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, it's fascinating. Um, oh, the whole thing is fascinating. The whole, but it, it's also creepy to me that they have our data and are looking at this and and know like 
how to persuade us so easily. And mm -hmm. that's where we are the products. Like our data is being shared and sold and manipulated in order for somebody else's gain. And yeah, so it's something to be aware of. And to influence Art. us, not just so that way they yeah. can sell to us, but that way they to can influence, influence us behaviors. and influence behavior. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of Russian bots that are paying a lot of money in order to tell you uh, misinformation. Yes. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> Wasn't yeah. spending it this political, but it's true. No, but it's <laughs> true. And I think people need to be aware of it because again, we're back to the word discernment. Mm -hmm. whatever you see, you have to ensure that if you're, and listen, we're not here to tell you to get off of social media. I think the idea is that the possibilities are endless to market your business and you don't have to be on social media if you don't want to be on social media to market your business. But the key here is at the end of this conversation is that you have to discern what you're seeing, what you're consuming and what you're letting influence you or not influence you. So yeah. I think that's the, the, this conversation in a nutshell. Would you agree, Meg? <laughs> I agree. I think that's a central thesis that you just, you just, you know, rattled it all off perfectly. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> all right, my friend, tell the listeners how they can find you, connect with you, learn more from you and even work with you. Sure. So if you want to hear more conversations around how people are marketing their business without dependence on social media, you can come over to my podcast, which is called Social Slowdown. Um, you can also check out the book that Robin has so graciously talked about throughout this, which is at socialslowdown.com slash book. Um, and if you want to learn about search engine optimization as one of those alternative strategies, I'm the founder of Love at First Search. So you can find that at loveatfirstsearch.com. Thank you, and Nick. don't DM me, please. Yes. <laughs> I won't. Really, you know what? Go have... ahead. DM me. I'm not going to talk back to you. It's fine. Just email us. <laughs> That's why we have contact forms. <laughs> These are oh boundaries. Gosh. I love it. I love it. All right, listeners. Thank you so much for being here. I hope that you had as much fun as I did talking with Meg and that you found this information helpful. If you found it helpful, please share it with a friend in business that may be struggling with the social media gods out there or just needs a little motivation to discern and follow their gut. Who knows? But share the episode and maybe you'll be get shedding a little bit of light on somebody else's business and making their life a little bit easier. All right, until next time, have a great week.